So today we're going to talk about how do we integrate Amazon Managed Blockchain and KLDB into your solutions portfolio. There's been a lot of noise in the industry and sometimes it becomes difficult to understand and differentiate which technology fits which use case best. So the way the, we will handle this talk, we will go through some of the trends, what we've learned um, over the last three years in the partner segment in blockchain, uh, DLT and uh, cryptographic verification. Uh, we will dive in a little bit deeper into Amazon Managed Blockchain, define what that is how it works, how you can get started. Um, then we'll focus switch on quantum ledger database, which I'm really excited to dig in a little bit deeper on this brand new technology that was designed for our customers um, and something we've been using internally for a long time. And at the end, we'll kind of do a little bit of an exercise to see how do we map a loyalty system to either one of these uh, technologies. If we have some extra time, I can walk through a demo of setting up a KLDB ledger through the console. This way you can understand how to uh, create tables, how to query historical data, and how to verify the digest for all of the changes. Um, I love questions. I would love to hear more from you guys and understand what is working, what is not working. So please reach out, please uh, stay after the session, um, and I would love to answer any questions that you might have. All right, so now that we have that out of the way, um, my name is Lana Kalashnik. I'm a principal blockchain architect, and I work um, with AWS partners, both consulting and technology partners. And essentially, my job is to build out the, uh, the community of partners that are equally skilled in vertical applications as they are with the technology itself. Uh, that could be blockchain, ledger technologies, or implementation um, thereof. So there are, there are a lot of related breakout sessions. Um, as far as the GPS uh, sessions, there's a Chalk Talk tomorrow. If you're really passionate about uh, permissionless blockchains, I would recommend checking out this Chalk Talk on how to set up an Ethereum um, infrastructure or write your first distributed application um, or a DAP. And it's led by uh, one of our um, awesome SAs, Carl. He's been working a lot on this. And also there are we have a few booths in the expo area where you can learn more about QLDB and AMB, which is Quantum Ledger Database and Amazon Managed Blockchain. We have a, a blockchain pub at the area, which is really cool. Some of our essays built it out, so you can actually see blockchain working in action and possibly grab a pint uh, and maybe win some giveaways. So there are a ton of stickers and whatever else at both of those um, locations. All right, so let's talk about blockchain at AWS Partner Network. As we've seen over the past two years, the landscape has changed quite drastically. So we have to constantly relearn and refine how we approach the segment. But I'm really happy to say that we are seeing growth and we are seeing more maturity in the solutions that our partners provide. So as of, uh, as of yesterday, we do support all major blockchain protocols either via our own solutions or partner solutions. So this would be marketplace listings, SaaS platforms, so on and so forth. Uh, we do have a brand new dedicated marketplace category. So if you're not familiar and if you're a technology partner and you're really trying to understand how to bring your product to customers faster, marketplace is a great fit. And we finally built up enough momentum to, uh, to warrant a blockchain category of its own. And we will be focusing on blockchain solutions for 2020 and beyond. And I will really focus on this one just to try to uh, explain our vision for the next year in blockchain and what we're focusing on, which is use cases and solutions. AWS Marketplace. We've been seeing a lot of growth as far as technology solutions. This is a very small sample of what's available there, but uh, we have over 70 solutions as of um, the last time I reviewed this deck. So uh, we have SaaS platforms that are focused on enterprises. They're all built by our partners. We have more complex 
deployments of CloudFormation templates that really allow you to set up the infrastructure properly and also standalone nodes. So those are really uh, useful if you have a single organization that you want to um, enable with a single node. Uh, so those could be spun up either via containers or AMIs. Um, and some of the partners that uh, we've been working with for a while, like Kaleido, has thousands of customers now that are focused on Ethereum applications. Um, uh, we have Sexton platform that is focused on Sawtooth and digital asset markup language. So very cool stuff, we'll talk about that later. And also Corda, uh, block apps, uh, some observability solutions, and uh, some newcomers such as Cadena that are really trying to push the boundaries of proof of work and scalable uh, Byzantine fault tolerance. So really awesome to see this momentum growing um, in those spaces. We've also seen uh, a lot of growth in Ethereum. Uh, companies such as Kaleida, who have mentioned, have been doing a lot of strides in the APAC, let's say, on working with Union Bank and Project I2I on bringing financial inclusions to the underbanked. Um, awesome stuff there. Infura started focusing on cloud-first architecture for Ethereum nodes. And if you try to run um, a, a single public blockchain node, you will quickly realize that there are some hard limits you will reach with scalability and high availability. So essentially they split the node apart and built it with a cloud-first approach. And also some layer two solutions uh, such as POA net network, uh, which they've done a tremendous job with the community um, and observability solutions, which also signals that we're starting to see some maturity with those solutions. APN blockchain consulting partners. This is gonna be a big focus for us for next year. And we've seen great success stories with partners like Accenture and Deloitte that are focusing on supply chain management, um, AT&T working on telecom applications with blockchain, um, data art working on um, insurance platforms. So one of their success stories was, was legal in general, where they're providing new business lines that are quite profitable for reinsurance business. In healthcare, we're seeing both the consulting and technology partners that are really using both ledger and blockchain technologies to eliminate waste and to provide cryptographic verification to PI records for uh, regulatory reasons. And media entertainment. So we're seeing companies like Sony and a few others focusing on digital rights manage management for assets, songs, um, attributions. Something else that we're seeing is that we're starting to see separation in the way we're building these solutions. Um, if you've been in the industry for a while, we kind of know that we have some public blockchain players, we have some permission blockchain players, and we had DLTs that are sp specifically built out for industries. Um, we've been working with BTP and Digital Asset on bringing DAML, which is a digital asset markup language, to different backends. And what we're realizing that smart contracts can be useful even without the blockchain. So here we're seeing the separation via um, Kubernetes, APIs, to make sure that you can take advantage of whichever backend might be suitable. So what about some trends? So the trends that we're seeing is that customers really want to focus on end-to-end -end solutions. They have done POCs, we've seen some success there, but to really focus on bringing these solutions to productions, we really need to start thinking about integrations with CRM systems or ERPs if we're talking about supply chain, interop. So how do we make sure we're not creating technical de debt? So how, do we, can, how can we reuse the same, uh, let's say, smart, contra smart contract constructs with different ledgers? Um, and integration into enterprise solutions of different kinds. So this is data management, so on and so forth. So these are some trends that we're seeing right now with our partners. We will not be going really deeply on what blockchain is in this talk. There are a lot of great beginner talks on this. So we will kind of skip straight into why cryptographic verification matters to our customers and why do they like ledger technologies. So why do our customers care about this? 
Well, as far as the ledger itself, the concept itself has been around for many, many years. So um, anything that is susceptible to double spend um, has been using historically ledgers for as long as, as we can remember. Cryptography. Cryptography is becoming really important with the rise of regulation on privacy uh, and making sure that we have auditable trail of records for logging, uh, public sector use cases, financial services, and smart contracts. So with smart contracts, we're redefining how we do ETL and how we can agree upon a certain, um, a, a certain use case. So smart contracts are essentially embedded applications that are working directly with ledgers. And when we're talking about ledger types, I want to make a few determinations of what we call ledgers and what are distributed ledgers. So ledger databases such as QODB, they do have centralized control, but they also have ordering and cryptographic verification of all of the transactions or blocks within this ledger database. And when we're looking at distributed ledger technologies, there's some separation there too. So technically blockchain falls under a DLT, graphs um, and DAGs fall under distributed ledger technologies. And we're seeing different use cases for um, all of these uh, uh, backends. Uh, the one we focus on the most in, the, in, the, um, in this talk would be blockchain in particular. So our customers also use cryptography for identity management and hashing. So there are different ways that we're starting to see encryption and cryptography being used in enterprise workloads. So data encryption, uh, this is not a new concept, but we are seeing customers that are really interested in focusing on encrypting their data in transit and at rest. So this is gonna play directly into any regulated industries for identity management. So here we're talking about PKI um, and Something that we've been doing, we've been exp expanding our own services, such as uh, KMS, to support ECC curves. So we can, we can support asymmet asymmetric um, signatures now, which is really important if you're talking about signing Ethereum transaction or even Bitcoin ones in a really cost efficient way. And you can still rotate the key, you can still have your root certificates and so on and so forth, but you can manage all of these technologies from, uh, from the same place. And hashing. As we dig in into how QLDB is built, you will see that hashing is used as, as our way to prove that the records haven't been tempered with. So this is really important if you're trying to prove that um, you know, chain of custody, if you're trying to audit uh, any assets. Uh, T-Mobile started, started on this a couple of years ago, so we worked with them and Intel on building Next platform or Next directory. Essentially, it's a rule-based access that is backed by blockchain. Well, you can kind of do that with QLDB too. All right, cryptographic verification. So we're gonna focus on how Merkle trees are used uh, as a part of QLDB to accelerate how quickly we can reconcile data and how quickly we can verify it. So if you're trying to uh, recalculate hashes, let's say in a sequential order for all of the changes to a document, you can still do it, but it's gonna take a while. If we're using data structures, structures such as Merkle tree, we can just compare the root of the Merkle tree and arrive to the same conclusion of whether something has been modified or not, which saves a ton of resources um, if you're looking to uh, submit any kind of audits, or if, if, you, if you're looking through your payment history, ordering claims, so on and so forth. So we're seeing a lot of um, use cases for using Merkle trees, even outside of blockchain. Smart contracts. And I've kind of mentioned this uh, previously a little bit. So for smart contracts, there are multiple definitions of what that means. Uh, but essentially in the context of this talk, we're gonna define smart contract as an embedded application. If you're coming from a, a backend or DBA background, it's very similar to a stored procedure, except for in a lot of cases, it's distributed between multiple members um, of, of a consortium, let's say, or a business network. Some of the leaders in the space are Solidity, which is used by Ethereum languages or variations of, um, chain code for Hyperledger Fabric, which essentially implements a certain set of uh, constructs either in Golang or JavaScript that allows you to interact with the 
Hyperledger Fabric Ledger, and Daml. Daml is a digital asset modeling language that started in the capital market space, but quickly finding adoption in, in different um, verticals. Some of the customers that have been building on AMB and QLDB are listed here. More than happy to dig into uh, their use cases after the talk and just really kind of differentiate on how customers are differentiating between uh, blockchain and ledgers. All right, so let's talk about Amazon Managed Blockchain. Amazon Managed Blockchain is a fully managed service that allows you to create manage, um, upgrade scalable blockchain networks with top uh, open source protocols. So we started here with Hyperledger Fabric and Ethereum, which you can simply spin up through your console. How does it work? So whenever you're looking to create a, a business network and you're usually we're seeing those applications done in the permission space. So this is your enterprises that are centered around um, a certain business applications. So let's say this is um, oil and gas. So we have 50 contractors that are working on the same project. So the way they would get started is one of them would create a network, invite other members to participate in the network, then add nodes. And at that point, you can actually exit the network. And this is something really special about A and B is that no one party owns the network, so nobody owns A and B. As soon as you've invited any other member, even the founding member can exit the network without sacrificing liveliness of the network itself, which is really important for uh, a consensus building. And after that, you simply start deploying applications. So applications are, uh, are smart contracts that we've mentioned in the previous slide. So this is your chain code applications that are launched into your peers. So as far as the differences that we're seeing between how our customers are using um, Hyperledger Fabric and Ethereum, uh, we're seeing majority of the use cases uh, that are leaning towards Fabric being in permission networks. So this application requires stringent privacy, role-based access, and membership services. So some of the example here would be financial applications uh, where certain tra trade-related data shouldn't be shared between all of the participants. You kind of want to share only the data about your transactions with the members that you are conducting business with. Where in Ethereum, we're seeing tokenization and some of more of the public blockchain use cases that allow for hyperscaling these networks. So as far as transaction flow within Hyperledger Fabric, as soon as you created the network, the transaction flow is actually one of the defining factors of how transactions are persisted onto the ledger and it's a part of the uh, consensus building. So consensus usually uh, consists in, in the sense of Fabric of ordering and liveliness. So ordering or security, we want to make sure that all of the transactions have been persisted in the sequential order to where we can prove with the help of Merkle trees that nothing has been tempered with. And liveliness meaning that we need to have a minimum number of nodes participating um, in the network for it to still exist. So here we want to make sure that, you know, if we have one member of the network exiting, the entire network doesn't go down. So because of this, um, submitting clients have client nodes that will be let's say spun up within your own account, they would submit a transaction proposal. And there could be different types of transactions. So there could be either initiating a new contract or invoking any methods within the, the launched contract. Uh, yeah, within the launched contract. So let's say updating a value, setting funds from A to B, uh, from you know, Julie to Bob. And uh, after the transaction is uh, it is proposed to the uh, to peer N, which has the chain code installed. It generates an endorsement signature, which is again sent back to the client node. And if you're pick, picking up client nodes, essentially drives the whole network. So blockchain itself can't do anything. You do need to have an application that invokes launches smart contracts and invo invokes methods within them. After that, we're sending the transaction after it's been approved. 
we made sure that the member who is sending this transaction is allowed to be on the network. So this is done via your certificate authorities. Uh, we want to make sure that the certain validation rules have been, um, have been followed through. So for example, if we have a network of five members, we define which three need to sign off and endorse this transaction before it can be sent for ordering. So once that is completed, we go into ordering service. So this is a part of the uh, what used to be done via Kafka, which we've changed. Uh, it, 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 this service assembles all of the transactions into blocks and then disseminates them to the peers. Something else that is special about Hyperledger Fabric is that we really want to make sure that the data is kept separate and private. So because of that, there is a concept of channels. So any members um, of this organization, let's say we have five companies, and only three of them want to be able to see data that they're sharing between each other, they would create a channel. And channel is, a section, is essentially a sub-ledger within the Fabric network. So it has uh, separate databases, it has separate deployment that is all handled by us on the back end. But what it does, it allows you, the entire network, to abide by the same governance rules let's say for adding or removing uh, members, but allows certain subset of customers to trade with anonymity from, uh, from uh, members four and five, let's say, that are part of this network. And also private data collection. So this enables storing private data on the ledger itself. Endorsement policies allow the chain code to specify uh, which members need to validate and transaction before submitting. So here's where we want to make sure, let's say we're transferring goods from A to B. Um, a smart contract would have an endorsement policy that would require both parties to sign off before we can say that the ownership of an asset has been transferred. And all of this is automated for us by Fabric. So this has been a five minute overview of pretty complex topic, but what we want to get away from this portion of it is that if we're talking about Amazon managed blockchain, we really want to focus on enterprise use cases where each member of the network wants to have their own copy of data. So as you're launching these peers, you will actually have your own copy of the ledger at all times, and you will have your copy of chain code install, installed on your endorsing peer. This not only takes care of the, uh, of the security uh, aspect of blockchain, but also provides sovereignty for the data source itself. So at any point, you can have all of your data in your account. Nobody else owns it. Now let's look at Amazon Quantum Ledger Database. So we've covered AMB, which focuses on blockchain. So we have separate peers that all have copy of a ledger. They're governed by a single ordering service, uh, which we've actually done a lot of modifications there too. Uh, we made it more durable by using um, underlying technology that pegs QLDB. So we made, we made it really durable to where you can actually cut down on a lot of errors that you would typically get was the, uh, was the Kafka-based ordering service. Um, so we've covered that one. Now let's look at Amazon Quantum Ledger Database. This service is really exciting. So we've built this years ago and have been using internally for many, many years. So if you're using services like Kinesis, it's based on QLDB. So this has been dog food by us for a long time. And a lot of customers are asking us, why did you launch this solution? Well, essentially we've decided that if you're trying to build one size fits all database, you're not gonna fit anyone. Because of this, you're still seeing us branch out into graph databases, time series databases, document stores, and now ledgers. So ledgers are really good for systems of record of any kind. And systems of record can be found in supply chain, healthcare applications, registration, financial services, they generally do have some kind of a system of record that has to be strictly ordered and often reported on. So because of this ledger, uh, uh, Amazon QLDB provides a complete immutable verifiable history of all changes to the application's data. So what is um, uh, some of the characteristics that our customers find useful as far as QLDB goes is the fact that it's completely immutable. It is an append-only sequence data store. We will dig into how that works later on, but there is no actual way to delete anything from the journal itself, which is a part of QLDB. 
you can provide cryptographic verification through the use of Merkle trees. If we have some time later on, I will show you how to create a digest to verify within a couple of seconds terabytes worth of data uh, to be correct and not uh, tempered with. It is highly scalable, so it is a serverless service uh, with HA built in, so you don't need to worry about providing any kind of HA considerations. It's all managed and done automatically. Um, actually, AMB is also highly available and scalable service, so both of them are, do have those attributes. It's easy to use. Another thing that we've launched here is uh, a particle. And since we're in Vegas, I'm gonna call it PartyQL. Uh, thank you for laughing. Uh, so if you're, if you're familiar with SQL, you will be really familiar with using particle. Uh, we've started with QLDB and bringing this to market, but we've been using internally the service for many years. Another thing that we've launched is a new data format, which is ION. And essentially it's a superset of JSON that is richly typed. Really, really important whenever you're, you're looking to uh, process numeric data because you can actually specify types instead of just the number. You can actually specify decimals, so on and so forth. It does have fully serializable is isolation. And one uh, kind of pearl of wisdom here is that this is where quantum came from. So quantum not from quantum computing, quantum from a single transaction that is committed. So it's the smartest, sm smallest part that you can commit to a database. So this is fully um, asset compliant transaction processes. So essentially either entire transaction succeeds according to OCC, which is optimistic concurrency, or it fails and gets kicked back. So it, it does provide pretty much um, immediate uh, verification of ordering of transactions. And it's a journal first database which is really important differentiation. So what does it mean when we talk about a journal first database? Whenever, you, whenever you're persisting an ion document to QLDB, it is, uh, it is written to the journal, which is the bottom layer that you're seeing here. So each document is stored into a block and the block contains the document itself and also some metadata. So as far as which strand it is, which you see only one strand there, uh, strand is kind of like a shard of QLDB, which right now we started with one, but we'll have multiples. And then each document is cryptographically linked to the next one. So it works very similarly to how blockchain works in the way that if you wanted to change anything in any of the previous blocks, you would have to recalculate all hashes. So you could immediately uh, identify that something has been reorganized. Uh, it is a strongly ordered service, and we actually didn't even build in APIs to change the journal itself. So it is append only. You can only modify documents or add new documents, but you can never, ever, ever delete. And it becomes really important if you're looking to make sure and, uh, that you can trust the data itself. Not even us, we don't have access to any of this data. But what's really cool, so if we're talk talking about deleting data. On blockchain, you can't do that. With QLDB, you can. So we do have this journal first database. So we have this log of documents that automatically get uh, flipped and shown as tables. So here we're seeing a user table and history of committed data. And what that means is that in the user or the current state table, we can add or delete um, any records, so any of the documents. But in the history, you can show all of the changes to the data. So what that does, it reduces the bloat to our current state of the ledger, but you can still query the history table to see um, insertion, modification, and deletion, deletions of data. Um, and we can dig into this deeper if, if we need to spend more time on how that works. So it's a very powerful construct in the way that journal is cryptographically linked, but at the same time, you do have flexibility of adding, modifying data in the current views. Let's touch briefly on Amazon QLDB data model uh, called ION. So ION is a richly typed um, format. As you can see, it supports um, comments, and also you can specify number types. So uh, right now we see that we have a, a decibel number specified where if you're trying to parse JSON, it, it becomes really hairy uh, trying to map to the right number type. And also as far as null values themselves, you can specify data type there too. We've added a few 
new data types to it. So outside of just the normal JSON structs and whatever else you might have, we've added uh, timestamps and a few other attributes that we find really, really useful. This has been open source, so if you wanted to use it even outside of QLDB, please feel free to download it, uh, play around, and see how you can make it useful in your applications. And now a particle. So if you can read the statement, you can read particle. So it's very, very similar in the way that it works with, um, very similar to any SQL querying language. Some of the changes that we've had here is that we do support dot notation, so you can have more elegant queries by specifying, let's say, engine dot truck directly without having nested queries. So it's really powerful in optimizing your query performance. So how do we make sure that the data can be verified? At any point, you can generate a digest. And the way it usually works is that, let's say we've submitted you know, a batch of data that we want to make sure can't be tempered with. We would generate a digest. And digest has two fields. So it has the, uh, the ID and this, uh, and, and this block number at which you've generated the digest. And what it allows you, it allows you to compare this digest to, that, that you've stored to the current um, ledger and quickly see if something has been changed. Um, and uh, yeah, so here we're seeing that, th that all of the records here, and so we have like cart insertion, we have an update to the document itself, you know, we have deletion. Every one of those documents have been cryptographically linked. In the, in the metadata, you will have this hash value of each previous block that is embedded into the next block. And then at the end, we have the digest, which essentially is the tip of the Merkle tree, which allows us to quickly and cheaply verify the entire ledger by just comparing those values. Now let's look about blockchain platform design considerations. A good use case to look at is loyalty and rewards. So if, you, if you're looking to build out a new use case with your customers, it's really important to take, um, let's say an existing application whenever they're talking to multiple parties. It's very rarely that we invent a brand new um, business processes in enterprise. As for something like loyalties or rewards, we will usually find uh, those already in existence. A lot of times they're just not optimized that well. So for this particular, uh, for this particular situation, we have a cross-seller partner network. Uh, and the, pro uh, the, the purpose of this system that we're building is to uh, create cross-organizational data points uh, and understand the impact of a brand launch in a complex reseller environment. And we also want to make sure that we can settle any transactions on rewards locally just within our own organization. So we want to improve the efficiency of our loyalty systems, and we also want to enforce some PI data. So now that we kind of know what AMB and QLDB does, we can separate those systems out. Rewards tend to be different from loyalty programs in the way rewards are generated, uh, they're usually focused around a single organization. So let's say you buy nine coffees, you get the 10th one free. It's very rarely where, where rewards are tied to multiple organizations. When we talk about loyalty, we really do measure impact of a brand launch in the reseller environment. So let's say we've, uh, we've added a new cartoon character um, and we want to see how does, that, how does that brand launch of a cartoon A influence merchant uh, sales for, let's say, T-shirts, amusement rights, so on and so forth. So here's where loyalty comes in. So we're, we're trying to define that. Now that we understand the two use cases, it becomes a lot easier to, to map out which technology to use. So for multi-party cross-selling organization, we probably would want to use um, a permission blockchain solution such as AMB. Here we would launch a single smart contract that would, add us, would allow us to add users, organizations to, to this network and to add or remove or cash out uh, your loyalty points between multiple parties. And for inter-organizational ledgers, so we want to just settle sales and attribute rewards, we we'll probably would just use a ledger database because we really don't want to share any of this data with anybody else on the network, but we do want to have strong ordering and performance of KLDB. So this is what a high-level 
cross-platform architecture would look like for loyalties. So we would have a single ledger, uh, which is Amazon managed blockchain. And as far as this particular block that we see on top, this would include the ordering service itself. It would include all of the peer nodes, which are uh, deployed in an HA manner for each member of the network in a certificate authority. And all of that is managed under the hood. The way you would connect to this network is through a private link co con connection, which also allows you to pass any of this data on your own private backbone. So these are additional security guarantees that are really attractive to enterprise users. So we've set up this loyalty network. We've launched our smart contract or chain code between all of the parties. So we can start tracking the behavior of, let's say, certain brands and attributing loyalty points to each uh, to each launch. And in the bottom, you can see that we're starting to look at the uh, integration and into enterprise systems. So we, we can differentiate, you know, how do we want to build the system for suppliers versus retailers versus manufacturers. For supplier, it's pretty straightforward. So here we see that we have um, the client application. So this would be your client node that would be interacting with the chain code. So launching new contracts submitting transactions. It would be doing that via VPC endpoint over private links. So you do have some of the APIs that are shared commonly be between the members. Makes it pretty easy for suppliers to submit transactions. For retailers though, we really want to make sure that we have our own uh, way to, to influence some of the customer decisions and provide a better experience. So here we can take some of the information that we're gathering from suppliers and manufacturers, which is anonymized, but then personalize, but, but then use services like personalize and so on and so forth to start building suggestions for your specific retail store. And we can also settle those transactions locally. So let's say as a retailer, we have a rewards program. So we wanna uh, send out coupons, we want to make sure that we're, we're drawing rewards just for our store itself, it would make a really good fit for QODB just because of the transactional throughput and the fact that you don't need to store data between multiple parties. Another interesting point here to, to pay attention to is that if we're looking at QODB, we have multi-thousands TPS per second and strong asset persistence, so which means that it's going to make a really good fit for uh, for financial use cases, settlements, um, and FSI. So here we can really start thinking about how do we use this as a system of record within a single organization. And then manufacturer. So the way we've been seeing that used with partners like Accenture and Deloitte that are actually presenting in uh, some demos is that manufacturer can uh, provide updates, let's say, or have visibility on the um, on the state of the asset or a loyalty uh, platform. So this is a high level overview of how you would define uh, this architecture. And I'm more than happy to kind of sidebar this and really dig into specific use cases. Something else that is important to point out is building out API separation for all of the systems. So the industry is still quite new. We're seeing a lot of bubbling. So you wanna make sure that all, your AP, all of the ledger Implementations are separated by an API from your, from your client apps. This is what you can have better uptime and experience for your users. All right, so here's some of the resources that you have available uh, to check out on uh, for partners. We're really interested in uh, just really focusing on specific solutions and driving end-to-end -end, um, customer experiences. Uh, you will see a, a blockchain uh, partner spotlight page with some of the success stories that our partners have been seeing in, um, in use cases from agriculture to uh, trade finance to healthcare and life sciences and also some Amazon managed blockchain resources. So here you will have tutorials, workshops um, and the same thing for QLDB. And also I urge you to contact your partner development manager for any questions. All right, so um, are you interested in seeing a, a quick QLDB demo just to see? Okay, cool. All right. I'm changing my password today. My old boss said that um, every 90 days you should send a new, set a new goal um, and just make it your password so this way you're reinforcing yourself to do it. Mine was don't get fired. Just kidding. I already changed it, so that's not real. All 
the reason we will be uh, demoing QLTB is just a lot faster to showcase that. With Amazon Managed Blockchain, we do have to set up um, other members of the network, so it's going to take a little bit longer. More than happy to do that after the session, so we can just sit down and just show how you would create the network, invite members, launch chain code, so on and so forth. Uh, but for the purposes of, of this session, I think QLDB will uh, be a better solution. So let's create our first um, quantum ledger database. So as you go into your console, it's pretty simple. You can select um, a name for the session. So we will name it a GPS summit. You can add any tags, optional values to make sure that you can query and report. Um, it, it is integrated into CloudWatch, so you can uh, refer to resources there. So let's create a ledger. It usually takes just a few seconds, so we're going to give it some time to create a ledger. Hopefully, the Wi-Fi gods will be kind to us. And as you can see, we have multiple um, ledgers already created here. So, all right, so we're done. We, we do have the ledger created, so let's get started. For loading sample applications, uh, we can do this manually by running queries, by inserting this ion documents that we've discussed and using particle to uh, you know, run inserts, updates, or deletions. But for the sake of time, we're just going to load um, sample application data that is available to everyone. So we're going to load a sample data. It should just take a couple of seconds. All right, we're done. So now we do have data in our QLDB. And let's look at what we have here. So as far as CloudWatch events, everything looks good. Our read and write IO is at one. So we're doing good there. So let's look at the query editor. Here we can select um, the ledger that you would write to, that they would like to query for data. So uh, and you, as you can see, we already have pre-populated table names. So when we loaded this data, we essentially inserted all of the transactions or journal or, or documents into this log, which is append only log, and it's been automatically translated into these four tables. So we have person, vehicle, vehicle re registration, and driver's license. So for that, you would call create a table. So th that's been automated for us. Uh, this no, it's yeah. Yeah. No, 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 no. Okay. Yeah, you're, you're good. So here on the person table, we see that we've created two indexes also. So we have a government ID for a person, and this use case is, is actually uh, going in production with a real DMV. So this is why we modeled this after them. So we have person index, we have vehicles that can be indexed on the VIN number, registration, and the driver's license. So let's try to modify a piece of data or you know, even query or something. So this information is available on the QLDB page. So right now we're going to try to modify a document in the ledger. So we're going to go and try to update a name. There we go. Okay, so here we ran a simple query. So we wanted to select metadata ID from the committed person SP, uh, where for the name Raul Lewis. So it works very similarly as you would interacting with any SQL based query. So here we do have an ID and something. Uh, that I really wanted to show you is how do we generate a digest. Um, we're not going to spend too much time on updating and verifying records. I think it's pretty self-explanatory. It's the same stuff, you know, update, create, uh, same queries that you would use for any SQL. But verification is something that's really interesting. So let's create a digest. So we're going to go to our ledgers. We're going to select our GPS summit ledger. and. We're going to generate a digest. So digest, if you remember, it's a point in time hash stamp. So it's going to show us the strand 
and the position of the block we're in and the, the hash itself of the ledger. So this way we can generate this and later come back and make sure that the, the data is still valid. So here we have the digest ID and we have the tip address. So this is where we're at right now in QLDB. Um, as I've mentioned right now, uh, QLDB supports a single strand, so the single journal, but hypothetically you could add more to it. And we have sequence number four. So we're gonna save this digest. We're gonna go back to a query editor. Yeah, so it does use the single ledger. It's really, really highly performant and scalable. But you do have, so the use case here, if you have a trusted authority, so let's say you have either a consortium with one party runs it. So let's say it's, you know, somebody that, it's, it's a chain of grocery stores that does maintain the ledger. They just want to prove to everybody that it hasn't been tempered with, but no smaller participants want to run it themselves. So in that case, having this central verifiable ledger is a, is, is a good use case. But yeah, in this case, it's a single one. Amazing question, because now we're gonna talk about flexi... Yeah, sorry, so the question is, like, let's say you have hundreds of thousands of users, how can you optimize querying for this one user? So the beauty of using um, ION format is that it's a document-first database, so you can actually optimize for that. So let's say that you have 100,000 users, but you want to pull up a particular order that they've submitted, so you would actually create this document table of orders. So you would pull it up and just optimize it as you would with a document database. Um, so essentially you don't have to create this joint, right, for you know, looping through all of the users to find the ID and then you know, the order details. You can actually specify the order as the document itself. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, and then also indexing. So you can index on multiple, um, I think that two indexes are supported right now. So you can you know, figure out what you want to... No, you don't. Yeah, no, so, so remember we are querying the tables, so we're not querying the journal itself. So the journal just provides cryptographic verification that nothing has been tempered with. QLDB automatically translates all of this data into tables. So then we're querying just the table. So we're not bloated by you know, all of the modification, we're just seeing the current state in the user table. So everything else we really don't care about. And if we want to make sure nothing has been tempered with, we can just compare the Merkle tree uh, route to the current state. Uh, yes. Yeah. So essentially the way you would do that is by looking up the history of uh, the history table for a certain use case. But yeah, that, that's how you would do it. All right. I don't want to anger DynamoDB, but I think this is way cooler. And I think, um, I think it's going to be really transformational in a lot of different use cases. So as, as you can see, it's a document. So it, is, it has a loose structure of the, of the data itself. So you're really not bound by, by anything. And you can transform it into whatever data structure or table type that, that you want to see. So I think it's, it's going to be really performant. So it, it's a document database. So it's not really a key value. But, uh, but yeah, and I think Dynamo has done some really cool stuff as far as, uh, okay, so we have, a, we have a microphone to do this. So, all right, so let's, let's verify the ledger really quickly. So here we can go to verification. So we requested um, the, the ledger itself. So we pulled it up, we stored the ledger, and let's say a year later you wanna verify that nothing has been tempered with. So you would go back um, to, our query editor. So we have GPS Summit. We wanted to look up metadata um, ID and the block address for a certain document. So we want to make sure that nothing has been tempered with as of this point. So we run this query and here we're getting the ID and the block address for this particular um, iteration. 
So we will take these two values and go into verification. So we have um, document ID, we'll paste here. And then we have block address. So block address, as you can see, consists of the strand ID. So this is your journal and also this sequence number. So we've populated this. Now we're gonna upload the digest that we've just created. And you can see that it's also stored in the ion format. You can quickly examine what's a part of the um, digest. It pre-populates some fields for us and we can verify. All right, so it's, it has been verified. So we've compared the, the hashes everything fits and we can actually even explore here the proofs of hashes. So if you wanted to manually recalculate all of the previous blocks, you could do it with just like pen and pencil, it might just take a while. So I think that's a really cool thing that QLDB team did by, uh, by adding this manual verification step to where you can. Uh, for, yes, yeah, so it does support an SDK and APIs. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You don't have to do it through the console, it just helps with the, uh, the question was, is there an API? So yeah, there are SDKs. So something else that the team did, they've built two drivers. One is a, a Java driver, and I believe the Python one is in testing right now. Um, if you need different languages, please let us know. We will bump it up as far as priority goes. But it really automates um, some of the retries, let's say for asset transactions. So let's say something didn't get persisted because there was a conflict, got kicked back. So this driver really helps you automate some of those cumbersome things that you really don't want to uh, worry about. No, I think, I think there would have to be a, a step there on kind of for the transformation itself. But you could, you could just, you know, create a hash, let's say for, for your table itself and then store it on QLDB or blockchain for that matter, and then use it to verify um, data there. Um, but yeah, you would need to write an application. And it's a really good question as, actually on how you would use these um, platforms. So QLDB has been designed as a system of record. So you really don't want to store a lot of data there. You just want to store the, you know, just the documents itself. Yeah. So just not to bloat it and it improves transactional performance also. Um, same thing with, uh, was Amazon managed blockchain. So from, from that perspective, you don't want to store any data on blockchain that you don't want to delete. Right. So, um, any kind of PI data is just generally is not a, it's not, it's not a good idea to store on blockchain. Okay, well, um, I think we have five more minutes left. Um, so I will take some questions off stage. So it's a little bit less awkward with the headphones. Um, uh, please let us know what you would like to hear about next time and uh, reach out to your partner development managers or us. We would love to kind of see what we can build together for, for next reInvent. Right, thank you.